So welcome everyone. Good evening. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Tulsi Chase. I'm the head of education and outreach at the Sadhguru Center for a Conscious Planet. And we're very happy to welcome you all today to our Sadhguru Center speaker series, which are our monthly presentations, virtual lectures, discussions, highlighting the research and exploration of our multidisciplinary community of scientists, global ex experts, and thought leaders. So just a little bit about our center for those of you who might be joining us for the first time. We are a multidisciplinary research center based within the Department of Anesthesia, Critical Care and Pain Medicine at the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, which is a Harvard affiliate teaching hospital here in Boston. And our focus of our center is really to bring tools of well-being to both patients and healthcare providers to enhance consciousness, cognition and compassion. So our work happens at the nexus of research, education, and outreach. We offer wellness programs, conduct scientific studies in various communities, and also bring together world leaders from diverse fields to collaborate and innovate health and well-being solutions. If you want to learn a little bit more about our center, uh, my colleague will be sharing a link to our website in the chat now. And without further ado, I'm really excited for today's talk from one of our incredible collaborators and supporters of our center, Dr. Elisa Eppel. She is a professor and vice chair at University of California, San Francisco, and she studies contemplative health psychology, specifically looking at how chronic stress can impact mental health and biological aging throughout the lifespan, including intergenerational transmission of health and how contemplative interventions may promote emotional well-being, resilience, and physiological thriving, especially in the face of existential stress. And all of you can imagine how impactful and important and meaningful this work is even more during a time like this, right? So she's very interested in climate distress and action. She's the director of Aging, Metabolism, and Emotions Center, associate director of the Center for Health and Community, and also a member of the National Academy of Medicine. She's also in the past co-chaired the Mind and Life Institute Steering Council. And currently she is testing how short-term interventions to improve stress resilience and physiological uh, homeostatic capacity can slow aging. She co-leads studies funded by NIA, NCCIH, NIDDK, and NHLBI, including an NIH-funded National Stress Network and an Emotional Wellbeing Network and has been involved in NIH initiatives on reversibility of early life adversity and science of behavior change. Dr. Apple also co-wrote The Telomere Effect with Elizabeth Blackburn, which is a New York Times bestseller in 30 languages, and the upcoming Stress Prescription. Her work has been featured in venues such as TED Med, NBC's Today's Show, CBS's Morning Show, 60 Minutes, National Public Radio, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Wisdom 2.0, Health 2.0, and in many science documentaries. And I feel very grateful and lucky to have Dr. Apple here with us today to share a little bit more about stress and aging and specifically looking at how psychological stress can impact cellular aging. Thank you so much, Dr. Apple, for joining us today. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Tulsi, for that generous introduction. And it is truly an honor to talk to all of you there and the Sadhguru Center, which I have um, gotten to know over this past year and am just so impressed and excited by its mission, the people, the dedication, and how much you guys have done since you launched. And there's a lot of overlap in interest and mission in what I do over here. Um, in terms of integrating mind-body practices, conscious states to improve biological health outcomes. Um, I'm also involved in Mind and Life, which shares a common mission. And I will say that my, my research life really changed after understanding that we could integrate contemplative wisdom and contemplative science into our Western methods. And that has just made the research world so much more exciting, interesting, and meaningful. Um, and I think we still have a, a far ways to go in terms of understanding how to measure states of mind and mind-body that, that matter. 
So I'll, I'll, I'll mention this toward the end that, you know, the ways that we narrowly define emotional well-being and how we could do better to measure more pro-social states, altruism, compassion, interoceptive awareness, um, all sorts of ways that we feel both our individuality versus our connectedness. So I am going to go through, I guess, about 15 years of research very quickly, which I call the dark side, which is just showing you how there is a strong foundation of research showing that toxic stress, chronic stress, traumatic stress is impacting our aging processes and contributing to a shortened longevity. And I'll spend more time on how we can think about the positive side of stress. What is positive stress? How can we use that? Because actually our bodies are, are well wired to have a beneficial response to short-term acute and intermittent stress, which I call hormetic, which has been called hormetic stress and just hasn't been studied in humans much. Um, and then I'll, I'll focus on intervention since I know that is, this is a amazing group that is working on different health conditions and healthcare. And so it's those applications that I'm also excited about. So I will um, talk about interventions. I am not sharing slides, but I'm, uh, Two disclosures not so related to my talk. The first is a digital platform for treating depression. Well, the second is related, which is a nonprofit foundation to promote integrative salutary strategies for mental health, for psychiatric disease. Um, so it's a new foundation that I'm excited about that looks at nutrition, mind-body practices, and hormetic stress for treating depression, et cetera. So, uh, We'll talk about toxic stress briefly, hermetic stress, and then interventions, how we can build stress resilience. And uh, it just feels like in the last few years, um, we've all been that kind of ruffled cat. And I've given a lot of talks on burnout. And I know at your institution, you have also been dealing with a lot of um, you know, heavy levels of burnout, especially in our clinicians, but it hits our researchers too. And how can we manage, how can we live well with ease in a world that is so full of adversity right now and threats? So that's something that I would like to discuss at the end. I started off with this, you know, uh, I will say evergreen model of allostatic load by the late Bruce McEwen, which is simply a way to understand how our life experience gets under the skin and how we perceive stress and how that leads to chronically elevated physiological responses. And over time, this tax on allostasis, this heavy um, level of, in a sense, fighting stress or keeping our baseline at a level that's, that's consistent with high stress leads to allostatic load, built up damage at the cellular level and at the systemic level, and even at the organ level. So with this model, I've become, early on became interested in both enhanced allostasis, what creates enhanced regulation, a youthful system, a system that can respond to stress with great stress resilience, and, and what promotes allostatic load, particularly at the cellular level. There are many easy ways we can study cellular aging, which has made this quite an, an exciting field to do human studies in, to go in and get blood and look at interventions. And so, for example, uh, I have been looking at telomere shortening for the last 15 years with Elizabeth Blackburn, who won the Nobel Prize for helping discover the telomerase and its function uh, elongating and stabilizing telomeres. So you can see telomeres at the ends of the chromosomes. They are um, made of base pairs and they're highly regulated. They're not genes. They protect the genome and they look out for danger in the cell. So in a sense, they're detecting stress signals, biochemical signals in the cell. If there's too much stress and damage, those telomeres will send out cell cycle arrest signals and the cell will either become senescent, no longer replicating, or will go through apoptosis and die. So telomeres can shorten and telomeres can be damaged. And in both of those ways, they're sensitive to stress and they regulate the longevity of cells and of tissues. Systemic inflammation is of course our global highway to disease and aging, early aging. 
and is best friends with telomeres. So short telomeres promote a pro-inflammatory state. There is also, there are now easy ways to measure mitochondria. I've been working with Martin Picard at Columbia, looking at stress and mitochondrial function. And um, we've published a few years ago, the first paper showing chronic stress is associated with dampened, almost dysfunctional levels of mitochondrial enzyme activity. And then there's the, um, the newest, fastest growing area of cellular aging, which is looking at the epigenetics, particularly the epigenetic clocks. Uh, developed first by Steve Horvath, and there are many different clocks developed to predict different outcomes. So these these are these systems are all associated. They're they're independent but related pathways of cellular aging. They have all been related to chronic stress by now and traumatic stress. And a question is, how can we slow the rate of aging? Can we look inside the blood at the cellular level and and measure, use these as a barometer of change. We know that early life adversity is a particularly pernicious type of stress that embeds and causes biological aging early. So adverse childhood experiences or ACEs are a strong predictor of poor adult mental and physical health. And we, we've known that for years and years, but we now know that there is this biological embedding we can measure again with these blood measures, telomeres, inflammation, and epigenetic clock acceleration are all associated with early life trauma. Uh, I've been studying cohorts of caregivers, both dementia caregivers and parents of children with chronic conditions such as autism. In, our, um, in one of our studies of healthy premenopausal women who had children, half were caregivers, uh, 180 women, we just went through the list of what we could measure in blood in terms of aging in this particular study, telomeres were not shorter in the caregivers, but in most of our studies, they tend to be. Uh, but you can see here that the caregivers had lower telomerase, the enzyme that promotes telomere length, dampened mitochondria, older immune phenotyping, lower levels of the anti-aging longevity hormone clotho, which is important for cognition, uh, lower levels of progenitor cells. Uh, these are the cells that help promote rejuvenation of the cardiovascular lining. And uh, they are, our young caregivers also have greater levels of insulin resistance. And I will say that that is probably our strongest effect. When we look at young people under chronic stress, it's the insulin resistance that uh, is a more of a consistent signature. So I won't go on documenting gloom and doom. Uh, this is an example of the lower cloth though in our caregivers and this core you know one way to look at aging is the correlation of age with the with the level of the biomarker usually is going to slope down more in populations that are under some type of chronic stressor whether it's a chronic disease or chronic psychological stress you can see the black line the caregivers had more of a gradient losing more cloth though in midlife there have been many cross-sectional studies showing meditation, lifestyle, quality sleep, and um, a Mediterranean diet or high fruits and vegetables are associated with longer telomeres. And there are a growing number of intervention studies showing that interventions such as exercise in dementia caregivers can stabilize or lengthen telomeres. And I won't go into this. I'll say that we need more studies. Findings are often mixed with telomeres. They change. They don't change quickly, and they're also hard to measure. The PCR method is not good for clinical trials. The Southern blot method is a lot more reliable. And most, most the majority of studies are all in PCR because it's, it's so much easier and cheaper. Um, but I did write a book on this that Tulsi mentioned, and so I won't go deeply into this, but Elizabeth Blackburn and I summarized the cellular, the epidemiology, and the clinical trials in our telomere effect study book. Okay, so I, I'll say that another strong area showing links to cellular aging is the set of mind-body interventions, just mindfulness, yoga, tai chi, qigong, uh, the core components, breathing and relaxation. These are all, um, have been associated with improvements in gene expression, particularly showing lower levels of genes ex expressed that are triggered by inflammation or the kind of key transcription factor for inflammation, NF-kappa-B. 
So there are several reviews on MBIs and, and uh, inflammation. And I would say that that's, that's a pretty solid finding at this point. What I'd like to talk about um, is not relaxation as much as positive stress. So hormetic stress is short-term intermittent stressors that um, can be actually anti-aging in a sense. And these have been shown at the cellular level and in flies and in rodents and have barely not been well tested in humans. In a classic study by uh, Gordon Lithgow, a longevity researcher who has studied flies, or sorry, worms, he found that you know if you heat worms just a bit, they actually become long-lived worms. And if you heat them too much, they do kill you. You get worm uh, funerals. So there is this inflection point. And we of course want to know what is the inflection point for when good stress turns to extreme or toxic stress. And that's an important question for all of our human studies. So I've been very interested in how people respond to adversity and how that can actually lead to more psychological growth and thriving and more biological enhanced allostasis. So this was one of my very first papers looking at uh, measures of psychological well-being and how that related to physiological well-being or adaptation to, for example, lab stressors. And, uh, and then a more modern version of looking at this question was really understanding we could look at this at the cellular level. We don't need to do tree or social stress tests necessarily if we want to see resilience. We can see resilience at the cellular level. And uh, this was a, a review paper as part of a new geroscience movement at NIH. The a geroscience movement is really about what can we understand about not treating disease, but really preventing disease through slowing aging. And in this paper, we point out there's a very well-developed model of cellular resistance to stress. Stress resistance, you could call, um, it's also been called adaptation to stress in these basic science paradigms, but we just don't apply this to humans enough. So that's what I've been focused on. And I wrote this recent review, toxic stress, hormetic stress, and rate of aging. And in this, I pose that um, the, in terms of longevity, there is an ideal exposure to stress. It's not the less, the better. It's that the more hormetic stress, the more optimal aging we'll see, stress rejuvenescence of tissues. Whereas when we have just toxic stress without recovery, we have acceleration of biological aging. Some of the, the interventions here or the um, stressors that have been used in these models are hot and cold temperature, different types of breathing, exercise, such as intermittent high intensity training or HIIT um, and nutrition. So what is the type of um, hormetic stress that we know works in humans? I'm just smiling because I showed you the answer before I asked you, but it's, it's simply exercise. It's one of our very few hormetic stress interventions that we exploit and know is good for us. Don't exploit enough. Um, in this really impressive review uh, by my colleague Cassie Beaton for this foundation I told you about, you can see that the evidence for exercise in reducing psychiatric morbidity is tremendous. And so the question arises, why don't we use this information? There have been 351 studies on any type of exercise and reducing depression, including clinical levels. And uh, the majority of these studies are positive. And so it's really a matter of like understanding how terrible it is to exercise when you're depressed and you don't want to and why we don't adhere and really adapting interventions and you know creating mental health coaches out of um, exercise physiologists and you know a whole niche there that that at the foundation we're trying to develop. I just wanted to point out that second dot, gray dot, that's a, a represents 120 studies and those were yoga studies. And more than half of those were positive, showing a positive effect on depression. So we're very excited about pointing out to people that exercise should be brought into our psychiatric clinics. And we're trying that at UCSF. Another stressor, hermetic stress, is heat exposure. And there have been about six studies showing that hyperthermia can lead to remission of even treatment-resistant depression. There need to be more studies. In general, um, it, this work is now being done at UCSF by Ashley Mason with Chuck Rizone in a uh, 
classic study, you can see that hyperthermia, two doses of hyperthermia raising the body temp, core body temperature led to remission of depression over six weeks. So there was a lasting effect of the hermetic stressor. It's probably causing a extreme acute stress response and inflammation response that then leads to recovery processes and the mechanisms are still being worked out. But there's a great new review just showing how sauna helps whole body aging in so many ways. And the mechanisms are similar to exercise and that last bullet there, optimizing the hormetic stress response and heat shock proteins. So this is interesting biology that we wanna capitalize on. Uh, so what, what do we call this um, in humans? It's been called the multiplex stress res resistance in lower species. And in humans, we might think of it as cross stressor resistance, that if we train in one type of stressor, we're more resistance to other types like, like psychological stress. So people who are fit tend to have less rumination, for example. Um, I got very interested in breathing. And again, I feel this is an understudied area. This is an area that, that the Sadhguru Center is leading in. And there are many... Uh, ancient breathing techniques that have not been well studied and understood that have it, it very important clinical effects. One is a Tibetan tumo breathing, where um, these are two studies, one by Herbert Benson, uh, far, or the late Herbert Benson. And in these, basically yogis increase their body temperature eight degrees. We think of the autonomic nervous system as not changeable, but clearly um, we can dramatically change things like temperature with breathing. And Wim Hof has recently brought this to a, the popular culture, particularly the gym culture, showing that um, four cycles of inhalations, 30 quick breaths, and then long breath retentions up to two minutes um, were promoting a more anti-inflammatory response. He also uses cold exposure in his protocol. And we've been studying this because it's been so popular by anecdote. And in one study, a very small pilot study in PNAS, they, um, it was shown that both Wim Hof had a lower anti uh, pro-inflammatory response to, to um, uh, an injection of a toxin. And then a small group of 10 men showed the same response. So it's a trainable response. It's not his unique physiology. So we, we are analyzing our own study, looking at uh, hormetic stress versus relaxation, mind-body relaxation. And so we just recruited people to build stress resilience. So we had more than enough, thousands of people literally si signed up. We um, took people who were high stress. This was a healthy midlife women. And they were assigned to three weeks of either HIT. Wim Hof breathing or low arousal conditions, mindfulness, and slow breathing. We had 140 women. We're still analyzing the biology. I will jump to tell you that everyone got better. The, the, when we look at general outcomes like perceived stress and depression, they are agnostic to technique often. We don't find superiority when we look at mindfulness, for example, but we find that um, there are many paths to reducing depression. We were impressed with these effect sizes at both post-intervention and maintenance. Uh, but we did find something unique about the hormetic stress, and that was that it incre increased positive emotion on a daily basis. Uh, Brian Don is a postdoc here with me, and you can see that in our daily diary over three weeks, we found an increase, a growing linear increase in positive emotion. So that was very interesting because positive emotion is such an important part of well being. So there are lots of questions for these types of stress. Uh, hormetic interventions, you know, really defining what's the right dose and frequency, what's too much. What about someone with chronic um, disease or um, an elderly person? Is, is there a positive effect in them as well? And um, what are the different pathways? We just saw that both uh, slow breathing and meditation reduce depressive symptoms as much as the, as exercise and Wim Hof breathing. Why? Like, what are the, they're, they're clearly working through different mechanisms. And so we wanna understand the different mechanisms. Um, I want to tell you, we are giving a, um, we have an open RFA for grants to study positive emotion well-being interventions. Um, so we're, we have grants for about $50,000.
and we would love for um, anyone interested to look at our network website and apply for these. We just announced the RFA. We also have postdocs in our emotional well-being network and our stress network. So this is a new NIH emotional well-being network that I help run at UCSF with both Ber colleagues at Berkeley and Laura Kubzanski at Harvard. And um, our per there are six national networks. Ours focuses on what promotes positive physiology and really what is positive physiology. So we are having a conference on positive physiology and I'll, I'll share the link to that. This is a model that Alexandra Croswell and I and colleagues here have been developing, which is simply thinking about not just relaxation, but deep rest states and how little we get of deep rest states. Deep rest states are quite unique to contemplative practices, to times when we can go inward and feel safe and really um, focus our attention on what we're doing or open awareness. So and in this model, you can see that our, our baseline, we pose that our baseline tends to be moderate threat arousal, so it's not a true baseline, and positive arousal interventions as well as contemplative interventions might bring us to more of a true baseline, a rest state, where we're having good balance between the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system. So in our model of deep rest, you need to feel safe. You cannot go into a deep contemplative state if you're feeling threatened by your environment or by thoughts you're having. And there's a change in breathing that happens during most of these practices that we believe is part of the parasympathetic dominance. And then both the mindset and the parasympathetic state from breathing, we believe contributes to the cellular optimization. So what do I mean by that? Well, we, we know what the stress response is and the, the kind of anticipatory stress responses, high allostasis, moderate arousal, kind of our baseline during the day, but we don't know as much about the cellular restorative states and the deep rest states, the biology there. And so that's, we're particularly interested in, in having the field define that more. Um, so, uh, so these grants that we're given, we want to see interventions that target emotional well-being and look at enhanced allostasis. And measures of positive physiology, it's an open box, depending on how you measure it. There are no well-accepted measures, but recovery from stress is likely a good one. Um, this is our upcoming conference, free, free online conference. So if you're interested, I hope you'll join. We're gonna have three of these over the next year. This is our first one focusing on the parasympathetic nervous system. Our next one will focus on more of the immune system and cellular aging processes like telomerase. So that's coming up October 25th. And then after this will be our deadline for the RFA where we hope to see some innovative interventions. I also help run a stress measurement network and we have um, helped serve the field by providing a, a toolbox of measures of stress to help harmonize the field and help people choose standardized measures. As part of these networks, we have harmonized data from 10 national studies, um, including the LASI study in India and the ELSA study in the UK, Korean study, Irish study. Anyway, what, what these PIs have done while they're building their lo longitudinal cohorts to examine aging, is they've included similar measures, not as similar as we'd like, but you can see that for some measures like life, uh, life satisfaction, um, or single item life satisfaction, all 10 countries have this. So we can compare, do country comparisons. And the, these are measures of emotional well being. They're very limited, and we shouldn't be limited by what's out there and validated. We should create measures that are important, that we, that there are, where there are gaps. Um, so not just affect, purpose in life, and um, so life satisfaction, they're all important, but they don't. It's not a complete set of defining the human experience of well-being and uh, being a consciously connected person. The network has come to a agreement on what is well-being, and I'll just point out it's kind of an umbrella term for satisfaction, purpose, and ability to pursue goals. And I do feel that uh, this is missing the whole set of measures that are about interconnection, trust, altruism, spirituality, 
And so this is a new field that's now prioritized by NIH where I, I think we could use a lot more uh, research attention for looking at positive well-being. We are giving out pilot studies for $15,000 each to anyone who wants to analyze one country or compare countries on both stress measures and well-being measures. So we've, we've got a manual for stress measures on our stress network website, and we're almost ready to launch our manual for emotional well-being measures. Um, and just to show you the website, these are all on our website link. So it's www.emotionalwellbeing.org. So you can see our RFAs there. Okay, so uh, I wanted to briefly, um, we're going to have time for questions. I wanted to briefly tell you about a digital project we launched to increase positive emotion. There's this beautiful film with His Holiness the Dalai Lama and Archbishop Desmond Tutu about living through adversity with joy. And it's also about their friendship. It's a sweet film that's on lots of channels, Netflix, et cetera. And the mission that they gave to the documentary maker was spread joy. Don't just have people see this film, but find ways for them to experience it personally. So with the documentary team, Peggy Callahan, we've created a digital platform based on Ber Berkeley's uh, Greater Good Science Center where we've chosen seven positive emotion exercises. They only take a few minutes. And we would love to examine this globally in different countries and see what works for who and how much they work. And so far we have had 11,000 people join. We hope for you know 100,000. So please, please feel free to join. And if you think it's a worthy project, pass it on. We are considering this kind of a citizen science project. We'll make the data public. Um, for others to analyze. So far, we have found that after trying a joy exercise every day for seven days, we see an increase in well-being 20%, actually a bit more than 20%. That is as good as or better than any of these academic well-being studies. And, and we do think, it's not surprising because we do things like help people think about what they're grateful for and make a gratitude list or experience awe or do kind acts to strangers. And so these are things that we know are good for oneself as well as pro-social. And we see these lovely effects on daily mood. So this is the website, ggia.berkeley.edu slash big joy. And then I, I just wanna end really thinking with you on the question of what, where are we going when we think about mental health? We know that mental health was poor as a society before the pandemic. We now know that we're in a long-term crisis where we're gonna see the consequences of the social stressors we're facing for years and years. We know that our frontline workers, our therapists, our healthcare providers, et cetera, at every level are, are feeling tremendous levels of burnout. And then we have these overlapping social stressors of racism, social inequity, and of course the one we see in the news almost daily now about the climate crises. Is this new? Are, are hum, you know, this, uh, this level of existential stress feels new to me, but really um, different groups in this society, people of color and groups targeted for discrimination have been feeling types of existential stress all through history. But there is something unique to this climate crisis, which is it really could truly be the end of humanity as we know it. And we, and we all can see that more clearly now, and especially our youth. So the levels of climate distress are, are rising rapidly. And about 56% of youth in a 10 country survey reported feeling humanity is doomed. That is unbelievably alarming that is going to be, if not already, the cause of hopelessness and depression and anxiety. This was my hometown. This was just one day. And it's a, it was a day that people were alarmed and then they went on to business as usual. And what we know about the climate crisis is it is, for our view from being at medical centers, it is impacting health 
and that is something people gets people's attention and it's and it's ex impacting mental health in an in an even bigger way in a synergistic way and so these are aspects of climate that we want to think about in our work and our teaching and be active parts of this new crisis and it's impossible to ignore so there are ways we can incorporate it into our research eco anxiety extreme worry about the environment is high but so is post trauma and uh, symptoms from climate exposures at this point. So it's not just anticipating, it's that everyone is affected or knows people who will be affected, if not now, very soon. So we have uh, a mental health crisis from the climate crisis that is brewing. And it just raises the question to face it, reality as it is, and just ask yourself, what emotions do you feel about our future? And I would like to ask you, those of you comfortable, to chat that in. It's a dialogue that is important for us to be having. And my second question for you is, what do you convey to those around you, particularly youth, vulnerable people? I like that response. Thank you, Dan. Not good. <laughs> it's not good. Right, we have overlapping crises, we have war, we have uh, 2 billion climate refugees projected to be displaced. And so seeing this reality as it is leads to a question of how do you hold yourself? What qualities do you discern? What do you change? And I don't have a great answer, but I, am focusing on this now and trying to understand what is coping with this level of existential stress mean and how do we do this together? And the strategies that we study for maintaining allostasis and daily well-being are even more important, but not enough. And so I believe that there is a mindset that we need to explicitly and effortfully and consciously cultivate. And that is of expecting uncertainty, expecting the uncertain future rather than being shocked by it. Understanding how interdependent we are. So depending, um, depend on this interdependence to understand that there's no solutions that single people can do. There's nowhere you can just move to escape it. But understanding that social quantum change is a model that we can embrace, which is that single person and group action can have mass effects and this will be the largest movement that ever existed this will be a global movement of people working together and and our actions now mean much more than they do later amplifying the joy and purpose in life being being alive at this moment in humanity and these deep rest states that we so desperately need so action is the sponge for anxiety these Rather than just mentally coping, it's how are we turning toward doing our part in our local environment in some way that we can, we can touch, we can have impact. And certainly in medical schools, there's all sorts of ways to reduce carbon or raise awareness. Um, so we're gonna open it up for 10 minutes, of, uh, 15 minutes of questions. And uh, to summarize, I've kind of taken us on a zigzag path, but um, starting off with a understanding of the difference between toxic chronic stress, which has a catabolic and pro-aging effect on our biology, as well as disease outcomes. Hormetic stress, short-term acute stressors, particularly to the body, that can be anti-aging, but we really don't know much about the parameters, the dose and frequency for people at different periods of the lifespan. Um, breathing interventions are, I think, a great safe way to create these voluntary states of both hormetic stress and relaxation. Uh, Mind-body interventions are one of our important tools. They're not everything, but they're, they're, uh, I, I view them as um, necessary but not sufficient for our coping in our modern existential era. They appear to reduce inflammatory activity and in some studies stabilize telomerase, increased telomerase and stabilized telomere length. 
positive physiology is a beautiful focus. It's not very well funded. We have at least these pilot grants on this. So look at our network um, and be creative in your secondary measures for looking at not just disease markers and breakdown, but restorative markers and growth factors. And then thinking about emotional well being and how we can do better to measure consciousness and pro sociality. Gratitude to the Sadhguru Center for a Conscious Planet. I just am happy even just saying the name of your center <laughs> that you that you guys are working at this at such a high level um, in the medical institution, one of our, uh, you know, when, with kind of our top models of how we promote pain reduction and how we treat post COVID and all these these really thorny problems. So promoting consciousness, compassion, and health should be at kind of at the title of all of our medical schools. And I'm happy to see it's at Harvard. So this is my Twitter and my, my website for where we put a lot of our PDFs and uh, retreats and things of interest to people. So I, I left time for questions and I hope you'll have some. Thank you so much, Dr. Apple. That was incredible. I don't know how you managed to condense so much into uh, this short span of time. I see we have a couple of questions. I think Dr. Bala, do you want to get us started? I think there's also a question from Maria. Yeah, um, Elisa, thank you so much for um, so many initiatives that you've taken, especially going from the, you know, the disease and going towards the positive psychology aspects. I think it's very much needed that conversation we as physicians, we are stuck in the disease aspects all the time, looking at illnesses and treating them. So it's really wonderful to hear that. Um, one question I had for, um, uh, for you is, for all these global projects that you've taken up, um, how do you, the logistics is, how do you work from the IRB point of view? Do you have a single IRB that is helping you to collect data from all over the world? Or do you have to have multiple partners around the world? That's a good question. We, the global study that I'm involved in, we took the easy route, which is it's purely digital. And so we are not collecting, we're not seeing anyone or collecting any, any health data except self-report. In this study, uh, which is run out of the Emiliana uh, Simon Thomas from the Greater Good Center uh, at Berkeley, we have one IRB that everyone signs on before they they jump into using the app or the digital platform. And so it's incredibly simple in that way. It also means we're not paying people, you know, we're not getting into sensitive uh, collection of any sensitive information like suicidality. So there are limitations when you do this type of low risk digital study, but it is wonderful that we, you know, we have 10,000 people in um, over a hundred countries. Yeah, I might want to pick your brain uh, separately about how to go about doing that because we do have um, several thoughts, but um, our IRB is not been really helpful and we need to find some innovative ways to get around it. So yeah. I'll let others ask the question. Thank you so much again. And I love your message. The pandemic has taught us that we're vulnerable and we must be open. Time for leaders to step in and course correction. And um, I uh, agree with that 100%. And I also wonder about future leaders and how how we we need to encourage people to become leaders because we have so many, you know, we can see that the current leadership globally is not going to solve the climate crisis, right? No one's, no, no longer are we going to be looking for those IPCC meetings to create the transformation we need quickly enough. So, I mean, I love how AOC was elected by, you know, a group support process. And I think there's so many young, young adults that could step up and be supported. I do believe Dr. Keshavan, who is the head of psychiatry at Beth Israel Dickness Medical Center, have a few words to say. So I'll let him speak before Dr. Keshavan. Oh, so thank you very much, Bala, that um, I appreciate your giving me a chance to say 
couple of things. Um, yeah, first of all, uh, wonderful. And uh, in such a short period of time, that there's a tremendous uh, opportunity now. Um, you know, COVID has been a tremendous natural experiment for the world, if you will, which um, it really gives us an opportunity to learn more about how one can you know, take stress and convert toxic stress into hermetic stress and um, you know, look at potential benefits for everyone across all walks of life and also not just focus on illness, but also on health and towards positive health. So I think we have lived for too long in uh, in negative which is really should be the definition of health. Mm, beautiful. I love that. And I think psychiatry is has such potential for pushing this model where, um, you know, the flourishing to languishing model is that it's not about reducing symptoms, which we can sometimes do successfully with drugs, but it's about improving the quality of life, the purpose in life, the relationships. And you can do that with chronic anxiety and depression. It's not easy, but that's what will make the sweetness in life. And so I do think for psychiatry, we, you know, we tend to just focus on symptoms so much and forget the well-being. Dan Johnson. Thank you, Dr. Kishman. Yeah. Thank you. I think there. this is a question from Dan. Can you guys hear and see me? Yes, we can. Sorry, I wasn't wasn't gonna do the uh, uh, video, but figures. I, I like seeing here. my audience. Um, Thank you. <laughs> I have a couple of quick questions. Um, more, I was definitely interested about the hyperthermia um, study. Um, I do many years ago. I got a bad case of heat stroke, and I was sick for a few days. So I'm kind of curious to what level that goes to. And then the other is the flip side is the hyperthermia. Has there been any studies around that? Mm. Good question. So it's a great model of like un us understanding heat can be a toxic stressor or a hermetic stressor. So heat waves create terrible psychiatric sequela. Our emergency rooms, you know, use goes up fourfold, not just for heart, and health problems, but for um, psychiatric problems because the meds don't work and they make people agitated. And so chronic heat, for example, from a heat wave is not a hermetic stressor at all. The studies on hermetic stress, the, inf um, the hyperthermia studies, whole body hypothermia, where people are stepping into an infrared sauna, those are, I think, no more than 15 minutes. And there's even been heat studies in flies, I think four days of heat wave they're modeling and the telomeres show shortening in just four days. Um, that's not gonna happen in humans necessarily. We have sturdier telomeres than a four, you know, to survive a four day stress or we'd all be dead, but, um, but it just shows you the, you know, the model is so important, the kind of blips of stress when we can recover versus the, the overwhelming stressors of too cold or too hot for too many hours or days. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. So thank you. So the, the Wim Hof method that we, we were testing was more like cold showers for three minutes. So you start your hot shower and you end with three minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Alyssa, I think there are a few questions also in the chat. I can read them out for you if you'd prefer. Um, one is from Shruti. She's asking specific, first of all, she said, thank you, Dr. Apple, for the amazing talk. One of the studies you mentioned with only women, I would like to read the article if it's published. Thank you. So where might she be able to find this article? So I, I was probably talking about our caregiver, our mom caregiver studies. And on my website, I have on the research page, I have a study called SAGE, which is Stress and Aging for Parents. And I list all of the PDFs, they're right there. Um, so I, if you, if you can't find it, just email me um, or Tulsi will email me, I'm happy to share it. Um, I, the second question from Priya, I, 
I really like and I think about a lot. And it's very frustrating that we don't have a way to mainstream and disseminate interventions that don't have any funding behind them. They're not reimbursed by the medical um, healthcare system and they're not pushed by pharma. We really, we're really weak on that, right? So like exercise is an example. It's, you know, you can write a script for exercise, but we should have a whole industry around it that helps people actually do it. So breathing, meditation, um, to be adopted by mainstream, what is it going to take? I would love to hear your chats, your answers from this group. I will say that it's something our foundation, the foundation that I'm on um, the SAB for is promoting. They want to change medical care, particularly psychiatric care. And so they've done things and a small scale, and then tried to evaluate them to show they help bring in treadmills to acute psychiatric wards, for example, and showing that it reduces suicidality and self-harm. Another way is to create um, a field of professionals or uh, a, a community of practice around these. So for example, for exercise, for depressed people or people with schizophrenia or an anxiety disorder, they you can't really just jump into it. And if you do, it feels pretty terrible. And so there are reasons why you're never going to go back. And so we need protocols and guidance for helping people uh, ramp up slowly, starting with movement and yoga and depressed people like yoga a lot more than aerobic exercise. And that absolutely counts. I mean, in the end, in these studies are mostly there's some aerobic component to the exercise studies that are, are so effective for clinical depression, but you can't just jump there. And so uh, having trained coaches who understand mental health barriers to exercise, and maybe these are coaches who already have a degree in physiology or you know, are a um, personal trainer, those people should the, the foundation is trying to develop a degree to so people can get mental health training. So that's one way to think about promoting this. It's still a slow path. Any other ideas? Let's see. It's Go ahead. writing prescriptions, you know, educating doctors. So green, in New Zealand, writing green prescriptions has become common. Nature immersion, there's enough data on this idea of forest bathing, how to reduce blood pressure, to reduce anxiety. So the pat, the power of the pad for people with MDs is something that you know can certainly be exploited for these integrative interventions. So Lisa, one other thing while others are thinking about the questions I wanted to ask was, we're talking about hormetic stress. Seems like every stimulus can be eliciting different responses from different people. So some stimuli can be stressful for others, some stimuli may not be stressful. So how do you account for that in your studies when you, um, I mean, especially test for hormetic stress and you know uh, responses are gonna be different for different people and as you're building it all along the way? I couldn't agree more that there is tremendous individual variance depending on aspects of the person there, you know, whether they have depression, how fit they are, how old they are. And so all of those need to be taken into account. But I, I believe part of it is training a person to be uh, aware and responsive to their own edge and so that they're not pushing it too far. So it's not competitive. So for example, the breath retention, you hold it until you feel like you need to take a breath rather than hold it as long as you can and force it. And you know that would be too much hypoxia. Um, so, it's, so we try to train people to understand it's not competitive. It's all about within, you know, they don't need to breath hold for two minutes. It's just watching their own edge and being comfortable with that and understanding that um, you can relax into the edge. And then when you, when you meet the edge, you should stop. So HIT, for example, it's very, brief, but you shouldn't do it too frequently. You shouldn't do it every day. This is high intensity interval training. And you shouldn't just start off with that. You should start off with brisk walking. So I think people, there's a lot of wisdom people need for their own self-regulation and self-monitoring in dealing with this hormetic stressors. 
the spin-off of the same question is, it seems like there is no one size fit all approach. Um, we can probably, we should be doing different types of practices depending upon what people can take up. And also even within the same practice, different levels of practices or intensity. So uh, in all our publications, this is usually not typically adjusted for. We just take the means and we work with that. Um, so it seems like confounder adjustment is something that we miss in these studies a lot. And this doesn't seem to be an easy um, solution. For example, you know, on one side, we have perceived stress. On the other side, can we have something like, uh, what is your inbuilt resilience uh, that we can use it and adjust for? Um, so do you have any thoughts on how to do the confounder adjustment, even combining or collapsing all dimensions into a single dimension adjustment for? I, I think this is such a, a important and worthy topic to explore. I don't have great off the cuff answers, except for we should really dig here, dig in deep and, and measure a set of, of individual factors that may matter and make a difference. In our Wim Hof study, we did look at people with high stress, which I told you about, but also women with depression. We found that this is all still being analyzed, but I will say it looks like that the calming, slow breathing awareness, meditative breathing, was much better for them in a way we didn't see with just high stress. And so it was better for their nervous system. And I wouldn't necessarily have guessed that. I, I would have guessed that the hormetic stress would have been what they needed to disrupt the, um, you know, the biochemical state of depression, but it was really the uh, um, you know, more meditative breathing that helped this group more. So, I mean, that's one clue that you should look at severity of stress and depression. Um, we had thoughts about other things to measure. You know, it's funny that we don't know this, like with medications, you know, for prescribing medications, there are basic things like right. weight and other medications you look out for, but we don't have a science here for natural processes to think about what, what helps for who. Okay. I'm sorry, I went over and Tulsi had an announcement. So let's go back to Tulsi. <laughs> no, no problem. This is such an in interesting topic, definitely. And as actually I s work with uh, quite a few patients, some of whom have uh, many mental health challenges in addition to other physiological symptoms, for example, our long COVID patients or our cancer patients, you know, some of them um, also on medication for these mental health uh, disorders that they are dealing with. And it's really interesting to see how they do take to the simple meditative breathing practices like you like you mentioned, you know, we just teach them a simple four minute breathing practice. And I can see even on a Zoom screen, what a difference it makes just in those four minutes of watching them do the practice after they complete it, you can just see their whole face is relaxed. Mm -hmm. you know. And so like you know, as somebody who's helping and supporting these practices, it's it's been really, really beautiful to see how it has impacted people. And I'm looking forward to more and more studies coming out on this topic. Um, I also wanted to point out in the chat, there are a few uh, ideas from the group. Uh, I think Dan mentioned teaching mindfulness and similar items in elementary schools as a long-term solution. Uh, Dr. Macheri Keshavan talking about teaching these in medical schools um, as well. And yes, I, I think these are all phenomenal avenues that uh, can introduce uh, humans to these incredible tools that they already have within themselves and how to explore them, how to cultivate uh, a meditative experiences of consciousness from an early age and as part of their educational experiences. So I think that definitely uh, these are wonderful. Um, I, I also just wanted to thank you, Dr. Apple, for your time and your effort with sharing about this amazing work and all of the work that you're doing. Uh, thank you so much for, for sharing your evening with us today. And uh, I'm really happy for all of the people who could be here. Thank you all for joining us and engaging in the conversation. And we hope to hear more from you. You can definitely reach out to us if you have uh any questions and we can connect you with Dr. Apple as well. Um, we also wanted to, can everybody see my screen? Yes, okay. We also wanted to invite you all to uh, our upcoming event, 
uh, next month. It actually happens to be the same day as uh, an event that I think Dr. Apple also mentioned, but actually just after that. So you can attend both events. <laughs> um, this uh, upcoming speaker series event is on mechanisms of memory loss, and it's uh, taught. Uh, it's going to be led by Dr. Akshay Anand, who is a professor of neurology at the Postgraduate Institute of Medical Education and Research in India, and he's actually visiting from India and will be uh, joining us in person at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center at the Leventhal Conference Room. So we really hope that you can join us. Uh, a link to the event is shared in the chat so you can sign up and register. You can also scan the QR code and we hope that we'll see you there at 4 p.m. Um, for our in-person speaker series event. And then in line with many of the topics that were explored in this talk today, we do have some opportunities for uh, people to engage in some of these incredible meditation, mindfulness, breathing, and yoga practices. We actually teach it in person at our clinic right here in Brookline in Massachusetts and also online. We we work with many individuals one-on-one. -on -one. We work with patients with varying medical conditions as well as providers from across our hospital network and the Harvard Hospital Network. And we'd be happy to um, connect you with any resources that you might find useful. Uh, so you can definitely use this QR code and sign up and uh, avail of a consultation for yourself or for family or friend. And then I just wanted to also share, we have some incredible projects going on. We have our COVID long haulers project where we specifically look at the impacts of breathing and meditation on both the physiological health symptoms and somatic symptoms and specifically breathing discomfort, as well as supporting them with their mental health. And as many of you know, long COVID has such a range of effects. So we really wanted to create a program that would holistically target um, all of their different kinds of symptoms from physiological to neurological and psychological as well. And then we've also uh, been um, offering a program to cancer survivors for their physical and mental health and just supporting them to improve their management of their diagnosis and their treatment uh, and their daily quality of life. And then we have upcoming projects to support mental health in Parkinson's patients, uh, support patients with chronic dizziness, with cognitive neurology disorders, and as well as stroke. And then if you know anyone who is a long COVID patient and would benefit from these practices, or you yourself are experiencing any long COVID symptoms, you can actually join our program. It's free of charge and offered online. And you can also share this link with anyone that you think might benefit. So you can make use of this resource as well. And all of these resources are also being linked in the chat so you can directly connect. And finally, the best and easiest way to stay in touch with us and know about future programs and events with us is to connect with us on social media. We uh, operate under Dr. Bala's, uh, our director, Dr. Bala's handles, and you can connect with us on Twitter and LinkedIn and be the first to know about any upcoming events such as today's. So thank you all so much for joining us. If you haven't already, you can scan the QR code and sign up for our mailing list to be notified of all our future events. And you can reach out to us anytime. We really appreciate all of your participation and uh, for sharing this evening with us today. Thank you so much.